you could kind of have an identity crisis. And that's a little bit that I, what I've been going through the last probably six months, a little bit. All right, let's get to this week's guest, outdoor adventurer and creator and good friend of the podcast, Chad Lubinsky. Welcome back to Hiker Trash Radio, Chad. How's it going? Good, man. It's always, it's always a good time to be back on uh, Hiker Trash Radio. I, I enjoy doing this with you, man. Thank you so much. Hey, let's just get it out of the way right up front. Are you Hiker Trash? I think I, what, what did I do the other day that I was like, oh yeah, if this isn't hiker trash, I don't know what is. I was driving to the Wonderland Trail. It was like a 17 hour drive, you know, and I kind of had a layover. I had to get out and stretch my, stretch my legs and I wanted to go make coffee in the back of my car. And I'm looking, I'm looking at, can't find a freaking cup. So I'm like, dang, man. And so I take, I'm stretching my legs. I'm walking around the neighbor, this random neighborhood. And I see <laughs> this red Dixie cup on the ground in this like newly developed housing area. And I grab it. I was like, ah, this doesn't look too bad. Kind of looked at it a little bit. And that was my coffee cup. So I was like, yeah, man, I feel like that's kind of hiker trash. <laughs> For sure. I, I can't, I can't confirm. Yes. That is a hiker trash moment that, that, that defines you right there. Nicely done. Nicely done. Hey, you were on the podcast uh, about a year ago, almost yeah. a year ago. Mm -hmm. I, I, I pulled up the archives. I took a look before we started here tonight, and uh, you, your episode aired on August 26, 2020. Oh, really? Nice. Yes. Okay. Do you, you remember what it was called? No. no. It was Mountain FOMO. Oh, is that right? Mountain FOMO. FOMO, of course, being an acronym for fear of missing out. You must have said right. something during the episode that uh, yeah. struck a chord with me in that vein. So, ah, man, I need to go re-listen to that. It was a classic. It, it, it's gonna it's gonna air soon as a classic doc episode. Oh, nice. Yeah, you've heard of classic rock. That, that that's we have episodes called classic doc. Oh, doc, you just outdo yourself, man, with these. <laughs> I like it. I appreciate you laughing at the corny jokes. Uh, you're one of like four. And yeah, I, just send my check my wife, is, my wife is not one of them. So there you go. <laughs> All right. Now, I, I know that in the past I've called you Hooch because a lot of your social media handles are Chattahoochee, or at least one of your handles is Chattahoochee. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Is that is that is that your real trail name or is it that's just – Dude, Do you I have a trail hike. name? Have you picked one up? I don't hike with people long enough to to actually get a trail name. I don't think. <laughs> my, I mean, my last trail name on the Colorado Trail was Scratch, but that was because I had a a giant rash on my both legs. Twenty that was twenty twenty one. So I like Hooch though. You like Hooch? Okay, we'll stick with Hooch. Hooch man. All right. Now you've been on the pack podcast several times. You know that we have a segment towards the end of every episode called the hiking hack. I turn my turn to you and ask you yet again, you know, do you have any trail wisdom to share with our listeners to make their next outdoor experience even better? Well, so Hooch, if you're, if you were preparing for your next adventure and I was the one providing you with all your gear, what is the one specific piece of gear you would insist on being packed? Give me all the details on that piece of gear. Tell me why you've got to have it out there. And this could be any kind of item. It could be gear. It could be apparel. It could be a luxury item. So, Hooch, what is that item for you? So, I think maybe last time I, I talked about needing a pillow, a blow-up pillow. Always, I'm going to bring that. And that's probably what a lot of people might say. So, I'm going to go with, with a little bit of a different one. So, I have this, I would call it a neck scarf. I don't know how I would call it. Essentially, I always wear a hat when I'm hiking. And this has a a band that it like a very thin rubber band that kind of goes right here along your hat. And then it's got like a cloth that hangs down from the back essentially. Okay. And so you can take it on off or whatever. And I like using that in really super hot weather as opposed to a sun hoodie. Sun hoodies to me, they look rad, but they, you I mean, People cannot deny that those things are so hot when you have the hood up and it's hot weather. It's like, yeah, you look cool, but it is so hot. And so I like having the extra airflow that I have with this 
neck flap thing that I have. I, I could kick you that Amazon link. It's pretty sweet, sweet though. And yeah, so I'd say that's kind of like my, my go-to thing. Cause otherwise if I'm not using that, then I'm gonna have to use sunscreen, which I always suck at putting on. I always forget, or I always lose it. And then if it wasn't that, it's going to be the sun hoodie. So I like my neck sleeve or whatever you want to call it. Neck sleeve. That's a, that's a, I don't know if that's the name of it, but that's a, that's a I good don't think it term is. right there. <laughs> um, this is the first time we've had sun hoodie slander on the show. So Dude, that's a, okay. that's an extra five points. That's an extra five points for you on the, on our next segment. That's awesome because I have a very strong opinion about sun hoodies. I really do. Cause I like them. I think they look freaking cool, man. I think you look like a ninja in them. I think you look stylish, right? But I think that's why people wear them, especially when it's hot, dude. I get it. If it's in the fall, like, yeah, for sure. It totally makes sense. Or if it's cold out, that's kind of like my first, that's actually my first layer that I'll use in the morning. So I'll have like a button up long sleeve or a short sleeve, but then I'll have my sun hoodie on over the top of it, usually in the morning when I start hiking. And then I'll have my hood up, right? And it's cold. It's, you know, it's chilly and it's in the, you know, in the shadows. But dude, once the sun comes out and it's hot, it's like, you will not catch me wearing that unless I'm climbing or something and I'm not moving extremely hard. But dude, I don't get it. <laughs> like, I don't get them for that type of stuff. All right. For I'll all die on that gear, hill. I'll die on that hill. For all of our gear manufacturers listening in right now, I've got an idea. And if you if you use this idea, I get like 5% of, of whatever the, 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 the sales are. All right. There you go. Here it is. I got I got something next level for you, Hooch. Sun hoodie tank tops. Boom. <laughs> That's done. Mic drop. Like you got that. a tank top with a hood that comes over the top. Keep your head shaded, but you're nice and uh, airy there. It does not prevent the 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 misapplication of sunscreen, though. You're still on the hook for that. Yeah, you're definitely, especially with the arms and stuff. But that's that's what I'm saying. I think the hood is the hottest part of the whole thing because it's trapping so much heat. There's no airflow around your head. And like that is just, you know, if you ever wearing a hat and you take a hat off when you're in the summer hiking, you feel like a brand new person. But you can't you do know, it because you get sunburned. <laughs> yeah, you know what they call a sun hoodie without a hood, Hooch? They call that a shirt. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, they have those. I can't even suggest that as, an, as a new invention. They have those. That was good. <laughs> and, you know, you brought it up that you seem to have a problem with, with the application of sunscreen. I have to ask, what is the worst sunscreen misapplication you've done? Like where I put it or, or what do you mean? Yeah, where you didn't put it and where you ended up oh. being toasted. Oh, many places, but it's always my face. I have burnt the bottom of my nose from the snow. I burnt the bottom of my chin from the snow because everything would reflect off. They would get blisters there. I've burnt, put it this way, I'm bald. So I had, I was running with no hat on my 100 miler and I just had a headband like around the top part of my head, I had no sunscreen. So when I took off that headband at the end of this thing, my entire head, was red except for like this top part here. I look like a monk. And then it start and then it started peeling. So it would peel off. Dude, it was terrible. That was the worst sun sunburn I think I've ever had. My entire scalp was just fried. Where was the hundred miler? That was in Oregon. That was the Oregon Cascades hundred. And was the sun shining that day? I mean what what caused you oh, yeah. not to put sunscreen on the top of your bald pate? Probably because I had ultra brain and I wasn't, that was the last thing that I was thinking about. You know what I'm saying? I would, I remember when I would, I would, before I would get into aid stations, I'd have to like write down the notes app on my phone, what I would need at the aid stations. Cause every time I would get in there. I'd... Hey, Hooch, before we get too far down the trail, let's back up a little bit. Remind everybody where you grew up, what you did for fun as a kid and how in the world did you get involved in the through hiking cult? Yeah, man. So I was born and raised in Mawson, Wisconsin. So it's a, Super small town, 4,000 in South Central Wisconsin, field, Corn Belt type of stuff. And you were born in, you were born in South, you were, you were raised in South Central. Is that what you tell people? South Central. Yeah. It was just, I mean, that was our South Central conference was Mostad. So <laughs> known by football. So yeah. <laughs> but yeah, man, I moved out West in 20, 
14 right after college. So I've been out here for a decade now, actually it's a decade this year and moved to Oregon, lived there for nine years, then just moved to Wyoming and love it here. And I got involved in through hiking when I read this book called through hiking will break your heart by carrot Quinn. <laughs> yeah. Pretty good book. And yes. I was watching Darwin do his 2019 hikes and stuff or 18 or something. And then I went on my first hundred mile through hike through Oregon and had a great time, met a mentor on the trail that I didn't know was going to be a mentor, but he was about 64 or 67 years old. And he was whooping me on the trail when I was 27. And I thought, wow, there's a lot to learn with this. Cause I thought I knew from the videos and the books I was reading or whatever. And, and if it wasn't for him on that hundred mile trail, I probably would have had a miserable time, miserable time. But I learned a lot of things from him. And from there, I just, in 2020, I went and did the JMT northbound 2021 Colorado trail, 2022, you went to Highline trail 23 or no 23 was the, you went to Highline and then Wonderland this year. Yeah. And so next year I'm hoping to do like the tour to Mont Blanc, I think would be cool. I would like to take the GF on that for her first time. There's a lot of vert with it, but it seems like a cool experience. And I'd like to do a little more high routes is what I'm kind of looking forward to, I think. And yeah, so that's where I'm at. All right. It's interesting, the concept of when you start doing something, you've been doing it for just a little while, you think that you know more than you yeah. actually do. And when uh, you actually spend a little more time doing it, you realize exactly how much you don't know. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't have said that any better. I mean, and that's with everything that I've learned. I mean, so we talked about jujitsu. It's like, you think after the first couple classes, you know, so much stuff. And, but in reality, dude, you know, nothing. And once you even get your black belts, like, then you kind of start over. And so, yeah, man. And, and that's, and you know, honestly, though, I will say this with through hiking, I have kind of, I think I, with the Colorado trail, I think that was the longest I'll do. I actually think for me, like I was talking about before, I like doing, I like combining things. I like doing things that are, you know, have the through hiking, but then the climbing and then the scrambling and the trail running and all that type of stuff. And so I like combining things. And so I don't know how many more long, long through hikes are in me. I could maybe do fast pack the TRT or something. I think it would be cool. Fast packing is looks fun to me, but I almost feel like I kind of have figured through hiking out and I don't want to say, I don't want to be like kind of a D bag by saying that, you know what I mean? <laughs> but I don't know what else there is for me to figure out in my journey with through hiking. If that makes sense. Okay. All right. It does make sense. Yeah. Now the, the trails that you have done, have, I mean, you said the Colorado trail is the longest one, right? About mm -hmm. 500 miles. Mm-hmm. Is there anything to be learned from doing a 2,600 mile trail? Yeah. And I think the, the biggest thing that you would learn with that is the trail culture, the trail culture would be the biggest difference. And that would be the allure to me for the PCT or a trail like that would be meeting the people and then experiencing that trail culture, I think would be irre irreplaceable. But as far as like the technicalities of through hiking and resupplying and walking and the gear i don't know how much would change if that makes sense do you know what i mean and yeah. so that's that's kind of where i'm at with 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 through hiking so i like the, the skills that i've learned with through hiking i like taking that now to different areas whether that's you know climbing denali or something and knowing how to suffer that type of stuff i think is is kind of more where where i'm kind of trending towards in the my later years <laughs> my mid 30s we'll say that yeah I mean, suffering that is a transferable skill from from through mm -hmm. hiking i've taken yeah. that that skill of being able to suffer and taking that to uh, my my place of business yeah where i, I suffer <laughs> every day and i know that you yeah. recently you recently I, I don't know how recent but not that long ago let's say you you made a big leap in your life. You made a big change where you got away from the nine to five. Yeah, yeah. It's like, well, it's been about a year and a half now that I haven't had a nine to five. And 
it's it's definitely different, man. It's definitely different. I mean, <clears throat> actually, I was just talking to my girlfriend about this other day on a walk, and I was like, man, <laughs> like I was like, I kind of get why people don't go out because w- when you're doing your own business, you always feel like you could be doing more like on every hour of the day, even when I'm on the wonderland, man, I'm working because I'm filming and I'm filming different clips for social media or I'm filming this or that. And it's like, and even when I'm driving home, I'm like talking to my phone of like ideas that I have or whatever. And I feel like lazy if I'm not working, man. And so like, I couldn't even tell you, but then again, I like doing it too. It's like, I can't take a vacation. If I took a vacation, I would be this, I would do the same thing that I do here. I bring my laptop and I'd like have my coffee and I'd be like, editing something and I'd be like having a great time. So yeah, the, the difference, yeah. the difference is, is there are people out there who are in jobs where they cannot wait for the weekend or they can't yeah. wait for the vacation because they, they don't enjoy doing what they're doing. Yeah. Right. And so there's no way they would feel guilty on a vacation uh, because they're not thinking about work. But if you're doing something you actually love, if you're doing something that is your passion, then I can totally see that, that yeah. you would feel that guilt. Yeah. And now there is a there is one catch with that. And I would say that the catch would be you feel, and other creators have talked about this, you, you can feel boxed into one thing. And so like, I feel like my audience on Instagram, they, they know me for hiking, through hiking and t- stuff like that. And if I kind of go out of the box and I post about something else, like I definitely don't get the engagement that I typically get which as a creator is it's kind of consequent like you're not incentivized to post that stuff right and so you feel like you're boxed in to something like through hiking or hiking and if you feel like you've kind of outgrown that in a way but also at the same time it's the identity that your audience looks at you as you could kind of have an identity crisis and that's well, a little bit that I, what I've been going through the last probably six months, a little bit. Yeah. Now, Hooch, you know that I'm always on the lookout for a trail name for the episode. Identity Crisis might be this, right. <laughs> this episode's title. Okay. Love it. We're going to talk more about that and see exactly where you are uh, in the second half of the episode. I think this is a perfect time to take a brief break. We'll be right back and yeah, welcome back we are talking to chad Lubinsky, aka the hooch and in the first segment we we covered some ground there and uh found out a little bit about what he's been up to i want to get a deeper dive in this second segment here uh first of all i saw on your website um on your website on your your social media i was like oh I have had, <laughs> yeah you had some highlights on, on your instagram about rim to rim to rim yeah the grand yeah. canyon that's you know rim to rim is pretty challenging rim to rim to rim that's that's next level yeah man so, yeah so it was 43 miles eleven thousand and some feet of vert almost 12 i think 12k of vert yeah just a trail ran it and it was about took, took about 14 and a half hours it's a good time it was a good time it was challenging but we didn't die and we didn't run out of water. So, well, I shouldn't say that. We almost ran out of water. Actually, we did run out of water, but we can get into that later. Wow, that was kind of a roller coaster right there. We didn't run out of water. We almost ran out of water. We did run out of water. <laughs> yeah, man. I like taking people through loops, frankly. <laughs> now, what do you wish you had known about rim to rim to rim? Before, in hindsight, you know, looking back now, you've gone through it. What did you? What would you wish that you, you would have known beforehand? I feel like I was I was pretty dang dialed in on it because I had some buddies that ran it. But for the most part, with me, what really I think the biggest thing that I wish I would have known was to bring <laughs> how long the ascent up the north rim was so for context is you started the south rim at least i did i went down the south rim 
that's basically everything's chunked up into seven miles. That's seven miles of descent, five grand divert down. Then you go seven miles across the, or paralleling the stream, that Bright Angel Creek. And then from there you go seven miles, five grand divert up again, up to, or almost five grand divert up to uh, the North Rim. Okay. The problem with that is that basically my last water source at that point was this one area. And I thought that I was going to be totally good with just a liter of water to get me up to the North Rim. And that was a giant mistake. Not only because the sun was at, it was about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at that point. So the sun's getting hot and there's no shade. But I also, there was a trail crew there. And the trail crew was rolling rocks down the trail. So, dude, I'm sitting there. I'm like almost out of water. And I'm thinking, oh, man, I have another two miles up, which doesn't sound that far. But when you're having to do all that vert, it's going to take a while. And it's hot. And you're already almost basically out of water. And this lady just stops me. I have to stop for 30 minutes watching these guys roll rocks down the side of the hill getting and I'm baked getting baked by this there's no shade to sit in I'm getting out of water I'm telling this I'm like dude I'm out of water I need to get up to there I need to get some water I need to get back down oh you gotta wait you gotta wait and so I waited for 30 minutes in the sun just getting baked <laughs> and after that instance I was that was my low point I finally got up to the north rim and there was water up there and I was just like dizzy nauseous all that stuff that gets, you you know, you get from being dehydrated, but yeah. So that was the crux of it for me. I wish I would have had more, wish I would have took more than a liter of water. I mean, I should have at least took a liter and a half. I would have been way better off than what I did. So, but other than that, man, it went pretty, it went as about as good as it could have went. I would say. Nice. Now, if there isn't a work crew in your way, rolling rocks, how long did it take you to do seven miles up with 5,000 vert. Now I don't, so I think, I think it was actually <clears throat> cause you're at a slight, you're once you hit the bottom of the bread angel river and you start working your way through the Canyon up towards the North rim. So it's about 14 miles at that point, you know, you're, you're at a slight ascent. So I think you're doing like a thousand feet. So you get to that when you're doing that seven miles. And then I think it's another four, maybe four grand of vert from that. But yeah, I mean, it took, it took like what it seemed like forever. I think it was just a couple, I mean, it was just a couple hours. But what I was more concerned with was the, after that point was how my legs were going to feel going back up the South Rim. Cause I had had another five grand avert coming up through there. And by that time I was on mile 38 or something. And so, you know, and I, I know I've seen videos where people are freaking out at this because they're like just bonked and dead and their legs can't move. And now they have, now they look at this giant chasm in front of them and they're thinking, how am I going to get up this thing again? And so I'll tell you, I'll tell you how you get up it. Are you ready for this? this I'm ready. This I'm, the, I'm, I'm taking notes. This was the MVP move of the whole entire run. There's this bright angel. So at bright angel Creek, before you start your ascent, there's this campground and there's a cantina there. Like there's some lodging and stuff like at the very bottom and they sell lemonade for six bucks, just a Dixie cup of lemonade. And I got there and I got the $6 lemonade. It was ice cold. They put a bunch of ice in it and I just freaking slammed it. Right. And then they were offering, offering $1 refills. So I got another one, slam that one. And I felt like a million bucks after that at mile 38, whatever it was. And I ripped the ascent back up the South Rim. Like it was nothing, absolutely nothing. And so that was the MVP move if I, if there ever was one in the on the rim to rim to rim. And that's what I definitely encourage people to do when they are when they're running it. I wouldn't worry about stopping in there on the way or when you first pass it, you know, but definitely go there. On the way back, the other, I think, MVP move was I brought these things called rec packs. Have you ever heard of these things? They're called rec not. packs. Okay. How do, you, how do you spell rec? R-E-C, and then it's okay. P-A-K. And okay. they're about 10, 12 bucks a pop. But what they are is 
it's essentially kind of think about like protein powder, but it's in this, I don't know, little container that you just pour water in, shake it up, drink it down. And it's 700 calories straight to the dome, just like that. And so when you're on something like rim to rim to rim, it becomes really difficult to eat a lot, especially when it's hot. You're not really craving like crack, you know, you're not craving things that are drying your mouth out, which is snacks and all stuff that you traditionally eat. And so I knew, so I brought two of these rec packs with me because I knew I wasn't going to be wanting to eat and I needed, and I needed calories, but I didn't want to take the effort of eating. That makes, does that make sense? Totally. So I brought these rec packs and that, you know, that's 1400 calories right there down the hatch, super easy. Boom. You're done. And you don't have to sit there. I mean, eating 700 calories would be tough to do. Even and, and that sounds to people that have maybe never done something endurance wise, that sounds we, strange because why would you not want to eat when you're running that far? But you're just, your digestion is just really cut off. Your blood's not flowing to your stomach. And it's just a lot of times you're just not hungry. You're kind of nauseous. Yeah. So yeah. exhaustion. I mean, when, when you're exhausted, when you're really tired, I mean, eating is a chore. Chewing is a yeah, chore. Yeah. yeah 100%. Totally get that. Totally get that. Now it was 43 miles. How many hours did you say again? 14 hours? 14 and a half hours. Yeah. Which was pretty 14. good. I thought. Yeah. Wasn't yeah. What is your, what is your highest mileage day ever? Well, it would be the hundred miler, but that was over 31 and a half hours. So, yeah, so I'm talking 24 that. hours, 24 hours. What was your highest, highest mileage day? Probably whatever I was at on the hundred. <laughs> Probably 70 or something, something like that. Probably. Miles. Yeah. Okay. Something. Yeah. Yeah. But the funny thing was is that my 100 miler had 12,000 feet of vertical throughout the whole 100 miles. This had almost 12,000 feet of vertical in 43 miles in less than half. Right. Mm -hmm. So that I think that's one of the bigger cruxes on R3 is the vertical that you're doing. Yeah. I, I think you're doing it wrong, Hooch. I just signed up for the Big Bear Marathon, and uh, it's in November. And what I love about the Big Bear Marathon is they take you up in a bus to the start line, and then you run down the mountain to Redlands. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's got 5,000 feet of vert, but it, it's Downhill. going the right direction. Yeah, it's going the right direction. Oh, interesting. Over 26 miles? That's probably not too bad, then, on your knees. I'm just making up the 5,000 feet of vert. I, oh. I, I haven't actually looked, but it, it's all, it's a downhill marathon. It's all downhill. Oh, it's, that's awesome. In some places it's severe downhill, but yeah. Yeah, 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 for real. No, that's cool, man. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, you're going to crush it, man. Yes. So all, all of my Hiker Trash Radio listeners out there show up on November 16th, Redlands at the finish line of the Big Bear Marathon. Cheer me on. See if that's we can, right. we can do some damage out there. <laughs> Get him one of those uh, sun hoodies. I want you to be wearing one of those sleeveless sun hoodies. Yeah, that's right. My tank top, <laughs> my sun hoodie tank top. <laughs> yeah. Now, this past winter, did you do any split boarding? Oh, gosh. That's my, my that's been my jam, man. That's been my jam. I've, I've noticed really the been enjoying it. Yeah. I've been enjoying split boarding, man. And since moving over here to the Rocky Mountains, I've been obsessed with completing the 14ers, the 58 14ers. And so it's just Colorado's 58 highest peaks, which are all over 14,000 feet. And so I was able to do a couple of those winter ascents and descents on the split board, which was so fun. And then I also kind of, my zone two training instead of running was more going to the local resort and then just going uphill on my split board, coming down and doing three grand avert every time I would go there. and then. Yeah, it was great. It was great. I love, I love split boarding, man. It's, it's awesome. It's like hiking, but you get to ride down. Yes. I think this is where it all started. Correct me if I'm wrong of you combining things. I mean, this is like, yeah. it's, it's like hiking and, and snowboarding all packed into yeah. one. Oh, it's great, man. It's, I don't, I mean, I don't know. There's nothing like it. It's, it's really changed. I've went to the resort a few times this year and I was like sickened by it. <laughs> I was like, I don't like riding these things. I feel lazy. <laughs> it's it is good though because you get your reps in. You definitely can't get, you know, freaking thirty thousand feet of vertical downhill vertical 
doing a split boarding in a day that you can at a resort. And so in that aspect, I do like the resorts, but a few and far between for me anyway. <laughs> now, what other activities have you combined? Cause you, you want, you like to, you like to kind of uh, join things together and, and kind of a mixed media, mixed outdoor media uh, fashion. Yeah. I, some alpine climbing and things scrambling. A lot of those 14ers are kind of a mix of trail running, endurance running, especially if you're linking peaks together, scrambling, some climbing. And so you got to be used to some exposure and things. Nutrition, knowing how to, I think one of the biggest things too, that you get from through hiking, trail running, ultra running, all that stuff is how to take care of yourself. And what I mean by that is making sure you're staying on top of calories, making sure you're not getting sunburnt, making sure you're not chafing, like all these little things that can, that if you don't take care of right away can blow up later in the day or later on a trip in a through hike, you have to nip these things in the bud early because one of them may not take you out, but as they cumu accumulate, <laughs> they can definitely take you out. <laughs> Now, in terms of being a hybrid mountain athlete, so split boarding is, you know, like hiking and snowboarding. Uh, what other activities have you combined, though? Have you, I mean, I'm thinking automatically, I'm thinking triathlon, right? Or uh, the, what is the uh, Scandinavian sport uh, where you don't have the bike? It's just a swim run. They call it swim runs. You're doing mm -hmm. swimming and you're doing running. Yeah. And so, I mean, are you combining activities like that? No, I don't like swimming. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. No, doing, no, I'm not no. that. I'm not doing that. No. Nah. I mean, I thought a picnic would be cool, which is where, you know, you, you would go kind of do a triathlon in the mountains, a mountain right. picnic. I think that would be really cool. It would just, it would re definitely require me to learn how to swim, which I won't say is off limits. I think that maybe could be something that would be cool to do, but yeah, in terms of that, you know, that obvious of combining things. No, I haven't done any of that. Okay. All right. You know, I was going to ask what kinds of things in your, your regular life, your non-mountain adventure life, have you combined? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking right off the bat there, uh, you know, that hat that's also a beer holder, right? That, that's a, it's a good example of combining things. Have, have you done similar things? So what do you mean? Haven't you seen the Haven't you seen the hat that the guy's wearing? He's got a yeah. couple of holders on on the side with a beer oh, on yeah, it, a yeah. straw going down down to his mouth. So it's not just a hat; it's also a beer holder. I mean, right. Any other things like that in your life? For so efficiency? that I've taken from mountains to my life. You're saying? Sure. Anyway, you want to interpret this? Yeah, <laughs> we're just riffing here. <clears> hmm. <throat> You know, I was really just trying to find an find a way to work in the the beer helmet example. Yeah, I did it uh, clearly. Not not very artfully, but I I got it in there, and we we can laugh at it or, or we can move on. It's up to you. <laughs> I mean, I would say for the most part, it's just the suffering aspect of of mountains into business and the suffering in business into mountains, and then also the consistency. I mean, you need it for all both types of disciplines that you do. Mm -hmm. Each one of them help each other. I think in that aspect. No beer hat included. <laughs> no, no beer hat. Yes. And well, before we leave the the topic of uh, split boarding and snow activities and through hiking and kind of learning everything you you think you've learned in through hiking, I did have the chance to talk to Sean Forey. Do you know who Sean Forey is? Mm -mm. Sean Forey is one of uh, one of two people, a pair that set out to do a winter southbound through hike of the PCT. They actually started in like October and hiked, started at the Canadian border and hiked south. Uh, they made a documentary on it actually called Snow to Sand. It's uh, absolutely bonkers. Really? But I mean, just taking the topic of something that you think you know yeah, and yeah, then maybe sure. flipping it around and, and changing the yeah. time of year and, and it becomes something that's, that's barely possible. Totally. Yeah. I Introducing different parameters to yeah. to kind of challenge yourself with it and i'm not yeah it definitely i don't want to say that like through hiking is easy by any means 
I'm just saying that I feel like I got what I needed from it that I was looking for. I think the next baby frontier with me with that would be fast packing. I think fast packing is kind of cool. So that's where you're combining trail running essentially and through hiking and you're just going faster. So yeah, I think that would be kind of, I actually kind of experimented with this on the wonderland. I was starting to run the last couple of days just to see kind of how it would be. I mean, I had my hyperlight packs, not, I don't know if it's essentially a fast pack, but it was cool. I mean, you got, I had my big camera bouncing around on my shoulder, but other than that, it was, I liked it. I enjoyed it. So for fast packing and typically how, how big is your, what is your base? What does your pack look like? That's a great question, man. I actually was going to do a gear video on the wonderland today. And I like I said, I'm buying this house and I'm getting, I've, I'm in a different planet right now with everything that I'm trying to get and make sure it's, it's ready. So I've never weighed it. It's sitting right here. I'll grab it. I'll grab it. Okay. This is, this is an interactive uh, episode. Oh, but by the way, look at, look what we have. The neck thing. The neck thing. There you go. I see. I, I understand now. You know what I'm yes. saying now? You go yeah. like this and you put it like that. So it's a mullet. Brilliant. Yeah. It's a strap on mullet. Yes. Strap on mullet. A lot of strap ons in this episode. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> that, uh, that's, that's not going to be the episode title though. No. Strap on. But yeah, this is this is the bad boy right here. Everybody was commenting on it on trail and they were they said, Oh, I wish I had a pack that small and oh, are you fast packing and blah blah blah. And I actually I actually carried five days of food out from the start of the Wonderland, which uh, typically people I guess don't do. They resupply at these different places with boxes and things. And I just I just didn't do it. And so I started off kind of heavy, but I will get a base weight number to you when I do this gear video because I got to put everything in okay. it and I want to get it. But I'm not like a psycho about it. I just – I feel like the more money you spend, the lighter your pack will be. It's just like all about like kind of how much money you spend <laughs> or want to spend on it. You know what I mean? It's like, right. yeah, okay, let's get a duplex tent. Let me spend 700 bucks on this or whatever. But, okay, well, it's a pound or whatever. So, to and that's kind of where – I'm really ripping on through hiking though. I just, that's where I'm like through hiking. Yeah. But like, if you just got to get good gear, you just buy more gear. That's better. That's lighter. That's more expensive to get your best weight down essentially. But then on the other coin, it is, you got to make sure you're not packing your fears either. So there was a guy that I ran into on the trail and he said, Hey, can you show your pack to my wife? He's like, I just want to show her how small a pack can be because she had quite a large pack and extra shoes hanging off every which way and all this extra stuff. And I told him that I was like, yeah, you kind of just pack your fears. And he's like, Oh, what was that again? And he like wrote it down. And so, yeah, I think every time you go out on a through hike, you kind of realize, Oh, well, I guess I don't need that. Or I never use this. And for this year, for the Pacific Northwest in particular, I would typically always bring a raincoat, especially if I was in the Rocky Mountains because of these monsoon seasons. And if you've ever seen my Colorado Trail documentary, you know that I got caught in some bad monsoons. And so if I'm going on a Colorado trail, I'm going to bring a good raincoat. If I'm going on the Pacific Northwest in July or even August, I'm going to bring some thin, crappy, lightweight because it just doesn't rain. So you got to kind of know your client. If you know your climate, like you can kind of get away with things too. And I didn't even bring leggings or anything. Cause I knew it was, it was going to be warm. The other thing that was interesting about the Pacific Northwest, I never used my headlamp one time. Never used my headlamp one time. It was light all the way to hiker midnight. Dude, it was light. Yeah, for real. Yeah. And I would wake up at five 30 and start hiking by six. And I would go to bed at eight 30, nine o'clock, whatever. And dude, it was still light. I was like, huh, that's interesting, man. I didn't really need, I mean, you should always have a headlamp. Let's be clear. But yeah, it was interesting. I want to go back to something you said a little bit earlier where you were kind of uh, bagging on through hiking about the cost, right? If you want to go lighter, you just you just spend more money, right? There's, Pretty much. You, 
if you want to have a, a five or a seven pound base weight, I mean, you could do it. It's just going to, it's going to, going to take some money. Do you think that that might be seen in some circles as elitist? And maybe there, at some point there'll be a rebellion against that mm -hmm. and people will intentionally go heavier. Now bring back the, the big old framed packs of the 1960s and 70s. Let's go know. retro. Everything comes back, right? I mean, it it's, does. It's, a cycle. it's a pendulum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It totally is. And actually, as you repeated that back to me, which is the power of reflections, by the way, it is, I mean, because if you ask somebody, let's take Jupiter Hikes, for example, I don't know if he's necessarily one that's spending more money on gear. I think he just takes less stuff. Right. Because he's option. more he's he's more comfortable with suffering that's the other option right really it's can you suffer more and you know and then maybe buy more expensive gear sometimes too but yeah you can also definitely and so for those people that definitely take less gear i guess i have way more respect for it than somebody that just goes and buys all expensive stuff and all of a sudden boom magically their base weight is x number of pounds you know but yet they've never actually done a trail they've just done research but somebody that actually does a trail and is like, yeah, I don't need a pad. I just sleep on freaking whatever Jupiter hikes. He will find pine needles. He'll be like, yeah, I just, I don't know. He brings this tiny little microscopic pad. And he says, yeah, it's just about where you, you sleep. That's what really matters. And so that I respect like heck. But I don't really respect – I don't I don't know. That's why I'm not, like, too big into the gear YouTubers, and and I don't do it much myself either because I just don't – not into it. You just gave me the idea for the title of my book. It's going to be Spend or Suffer. Your Ooh. two choices to ultralight backpacking. Spend or Suffer. Yeah. What do you think? Pretty catchy. I think it makes total sense. Yeah. Are you actually right. writing a book? Uh, not yet, but – you know, I, I throw on all kinds of ideas. Well, maybe one day it'll stick. Yeah. No, that's cool. That's, that'd be a cool t-shirt too. <laughs> <laughs> Garage going gear. <laughs> all right. Hey, uh, let's talk about the Wonderland Trail. So how many miles uh, was it and how quick did you do it? Yeah, so the Wonderland is, it's like 91, 93 miles. So it's under 100. And so with that, I thought that, it would be a lot faster than it was, but it actually was slower than I thought. So you know how on the, on the JMT in particular, like an 18 mile day for me on the JMT is a pretty big day because it's a lot of up. It's a lot of down. It's, yeah. it's just a lot of vertical. Plus you're exposed to the sun. You're at altitude, all that type of thing. It was just kind of the same way at the, with the Wonderland trail, which was really kind of weird because you're not really at altitude at the Wonderland. I mean, the highest, point is 6,100 feet. I mean, I live at 7,200 feet. So the highest point is 6,100 feet. And then the other thing is a lot, of, you're in the shade quite a bit with the trees. And so the sun isn't too much of, a, of an issue, but man, I will say I got humbled by the ascents and the descents on these things. And I think a lot of it too, was because the trail was, it reminded me of what I haven't been to the East coast to hike, but you always hear they're not yeah. really graded that well. That's kind of how I felt with this trail a bit. It wasn't, it was just straight up pretty much a couple switchbacks and then straight down a couple switchbacks type of thing. Yeah. So that's how I would desc describe the Wonderland trail. So it was, I think a lot of people and this, I was actually talking to a ranger and she was saying how a lot of people think this is a really good first through hike because it's a smaller mileage. And that's what I thought too, going into it. I, was, I thought, oh yeah this could be good to bring somebody for the first time. But after going through it, I thought, Oh, I don't think this would be good for a first timer because it was, and that's what she said too. A lot of people get humbled by the vert on it. Yes. And any kind of surprises on the one? <laughs> yeah. Trail? yeah. So yeah, I got to this place called golden lakes and basically I was just on my, on my phone looking at the map, seeing what I had to do for vertical the next day. <laughs> and I was going down to this lake to filter water. And all of a sudden, and I look up and 20 feet in front of me on this tree is this little bear cub just sticking to the tree, looking at me. I got it on video too. He's just like looking at me. 
And then he kind of slowly creeps down. And then of course I'm looking for mom and mom's just kind of off to my right, 50 yards down with another cub looking at me. And I'm thinking, Oh dude, this ain't good. <laughs> you know what I mean? So obviously I back away and they kind of just keep feeding. I guess they're kind of the camp bears there at golden lakes. Cause there's a ranger station there. And they say that they're kind of always around. And it was, it was really interesting, man. I didn't know. Cause at one point I went down to the lake and the mom and the babies got separated. And I didn't know that they made kind of a weird woofing noise to get the babies back or the mom will make a woofing noise to kind of get the babies back to her, figure out where they're at, figure out their location. And so if you ever hear that in the woods, oh, be aware. It's kind of a, I don't remember, but yeah. That'll put a little fear in you. I mean, yeah, that's the first yeah. thing I thought of when you said you saw the cub is where, where is the mom? They're usually pretty darn protective. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. She was, she was pretty chill though. I mean, there was a lot of campers around, so she was pretty chill. Yeah. Okay. And you you didn't say how, was it five days you, you did the trail in? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Five days. I think most people, I think, mo- I think most people are doing it quite, they were taking at least seven, I think for the days, eight, nines and tens. And, but I think five was good for me on that. Cause it was uh, just enough to kind of challenge me, but not enough to completely crush me at the end of the end of the day. Yeah. Would you do it again? No. One no. and done. Yeah, it was too much trees. For me. I'd say eighty percent was in the trees, twenty percent good views. I would say it was. How did I describe it? It was like uh, up and down with occasional views of Rainier. <laughs> I think I was t- talking to about it, but because uh, this is Jamie Lamberts and her friends like favorite trail ever, and I think it's particularly if you are a Washington native, it's really special because you're always looking at Rainier. It's kind of the the big. It's the number one mountain in the state highest mountain in the state and so it's really special to walk around it so for natives i think they love it they love it they love it and i probably would have liked it more if i didn't drive 19 hours there as well it was like a two-day drive if i would have lived in oregon i probably would have been like a little bit better <laughs> now that's a one and done trail for you are there is there a repeat trail for you is there a trail that you don't you, you can't wait to get back on i think if i was to do i don't like doing things twice well, I shouldn't say that. I don't like doing like long, long things twice. I'll do like a, a short trail or something like that twice. But I think if there was one that I would do, it would definitely be the JMT. That just holds a special place in my heart. JMT was a very special trail and very aesthetic. I also think that the Timberline Trail, I've through hiked and trail ran that one around Mount Hood. That one's awesome. That's one of my favorite trails too. And that could be because I lived in Oregon and that was our state mountain. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. I just think on that one, it had way more views in a shorter amount of time than the Winterland did. Okay. Hey, you earlier in the episode, you talked about being in the middle of an identity crisis. Mm-hmm. Who, who is Chad Lubinsky? What, what's going on with you? We'll t- let's talk about the identity crisis just for a minute here. Yeah. So in referring back to, I guess what we were talking about was, when you make a being a creator your job, you kind of feel like you are in this box of a sort, and you feel like you only can create content in that box or in that medium. And you feel like if you step out of that box, if you discover a new hobby or a new, you are intrigued by something new, which is me, I like to learn, you feel like it's you feel like your audience isn't going to be as engaged. You feel like you're going to lose your relevancy and you feel like a lot of stuff that you're based on is going to kind of fall apart. Cause that's why people are following you. That's why your audience likes you essentially. And so you kind of fall into this conundrum. And like I was saying, I've kind of been in this the last six months or so to where I'm like, man, I don't know like what through hike I'm going to do to put on YouTube or, you know, do this or that. And so when you get into that, And then if you're only doing the through hikes because of the audience and not because you like to do it, that definitely shows. And so, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now is, is where I want to take my content going forward. And 
Do you have ideas? What do you want to do? What honestly, do you want to branch out into? Yeah, honestly, that's a great question. I think I love splitboarding. I'll always splitboard. I think I'll, there's going to be a lot of that. There's still a lot of like 14er stuff coming that I like to put on my YouTube channel and Instagram. And then I would like to maybe do Denali as well, climb that. But, you know, you know what actually happened? You know what actually, why this was? And not to get too somber on this, but I had a buddy that he, I met him last year, last June. Great guy. We climbed up Vail Mountain together. He was a crusher. He was 10 years older than me, stacked, big mountain guy. He would, he was a air, uh, when you jump out of planes, like instructor, he would do that. He'd split board all the time. He'd climb Mount Hood all the time. He would, uh, world traveler, just a, a badass, right? Well, he was split boarding and he went up to Mount Helens, Mount St. Helens, which is, if you know the mountains in the Pacific Northwest, it's like one of the easiest mountains to hike and summit. He went up there by himself. It was his 28th time. He gets to the top and he says, you need to, on video, you need to watch out for this cornice because, you know, it has a proclivity of falling because there's a cornice that always forms every year on the crater from the wind. And so what a cornice is for people that are listening, it's like a, a wall of snow that gets wind blown and it appears like there's something underneath it, but there's, it's just air. So if you have too much weight on it, it could definitely crumble. Well, not long after he films this video, he, he the cornice breaks and he falls into the, the crater into Mount St. Helens. And so that's 1,200 feet, 1,500 feet or something, falls. All of his stuff's at the top of the crater. There's nobody there because it's mid, I don't know if it was midweek or something, but it was definitely early in the morning. So I don't think anybody saw it. So he tries to climb up the crater to get back up to his stuff, falls, tries to do it again, falls. Then he doesn't get back up. And so he passes away in the crater of Mount St. Helens. And I had seen the day, so we had been texting about a month before about him coming out to do some 14ers with me because we really clicked. And I had seen this report and I knew he did St. Helens all the time. And I saw this report on PNW Mountaineers. Somebody passed away. They didn't know who it was. And I was thinking about texting him. And I was like, nah, it couldn't be Rocky. Couldn't be a dude. No way. And then Mountain House, because he's a Mountain House ambassador, texted me the next day. And they were like, hey, did you hear about, about Rocky? So ever since that, that was in April, actually. So ever since that, I my relationship with risk, <laughs> my relationship with adventure has all shifted. And I think that, is probably something that's common, but that was kind of the first person that I knew well that in the mountain community that passed away, right? Like unexpectedly. And so, yeah, that it's kind of been on my mind a lot whenever I'm doing stuff and like, why am I doing it type of thing? Am I doing it for the videos? Am I, why am I, am I risking my life doing this type of thing? So that's where I'm at. And yeah. That's what's been on my mind for a long time or for the yeah. last few months anyway. Yeah. Totally, totally understandable. And so sorry to hear about Rocky. That's a, uh, that's terrible news. Yeah. He was a good guy, man. Thanks. Uh, he, yeah. So since, so I don't know where my content will go. I'll, I will say this, like I originally moved. West. I liked hunting a lot, bow hunting and all that type of stuff. And so I might get more into that content. And maybe do something with that. I have some tags this year I'm really excited about. And I like the fact of like having organic meat, healthy stuff, dehydrate it myself for food on track. It'd be really cool. Full circle. So that's some things that excite me. But as far as like risky, risky stuff right now, I'm not like big into it. You know, like I had a buddy that wanted me to go climbing and stuff in the PMW when I was back. And I'm like, dude, I don't know. I'm not really feeling it. <laughs> so... Yeah, that's where I'm kind of at, but that was a good question. So not to not to get too somber, Rocky was a great guy, and uh, they wrote a really good article about him and his time there and what he did and how many people he uh, he affected and stuff. And so, yeah, he lived a good life. And 42 years, man, he he crushed. So, yeah, he's a good guy.
Okay. All right. Hey, we mentioned a little bit earlier, I think it was in this full episode, maybe not the teaser episode, that uh, you have been doing a podcast yourself. Why don't we give our, our listeners a quick description of what they can find on your podcast called Peanut Butter and Mountains Podcast. Yeah, Talk man. about combining things. Peanut Butter and Mountains, that's a good combination right there. Uh, the best, best thing you can have, right? Peanut Butter and Mountains. Yeah, so I... I with the peanut butter mountains, I kind of either fly solo on that or I will interview guests. I be tat people like that other through hikers and things, but not only through hikers, I'll also interview other kind of more hybrid athletes, other climbers or my friends, whatever. But for the most part, I would say how to sell that podcast would be. You kind of are learning from a bunch of different disciplines that I'm interested in. So whether that is about split boarding, trail running, endurance running through hiking. It's all, that's all the kind of stuff that encapsulates in that podcast. So yeah, I enjoy doing it too. I mean, as you know, you get to meet people under the guise of a podcast that you probably wouldn't talk to otherwise. And I think there's a lot of power in that network connection. And I really like how you do this because you will do kind of repeat episodes with repeat guests. And I think it, you know, it's always about relationships. So having those repeat episodes is a really good way to maintain that connection. And that's what I need to do more so going into this, maybe next season of the podcast is reconnect with some of the people that were really good guests. So yeah, kudos, man. That was good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, who you know where we are right now? Probably the hiking hack. Hiking hacks. See, that's the problem with repeat guests. You can't surprise them. They, they know what's coming. So that's right. It's time for your hiking hack. And this segment is sponsored by the outdoor clothing. This segment is sponsored by the outdoor clothing brand Magnet Designs. Through hiker like own and making quality ultralight craft outdoor gear by hand in Bend, Oregon. Designed on trail, built for trail life. Visit magnetdesigns.com with no E in designs. So, Hooch, what trail wisdom do you have for our listeners to make their next outdoor adventure even better? I think a good one is, so if you have, in, okay, we talk about, like, doing more with less type of thing. One of the things that I have, and since I have it right next to me, is I like using these nylo flume pack liners right here. So, what this is basically, or it could be a garbage bag, really. But I will use these pack liners instead of a pack cover to store all my gear that I want to keep dry. Sleeping bag, pillow, pad, extra socks, stuff like that. And th that'll be the first thing in my pack. I'll wrap that up, and then I'll put the rest of my stuff over my backpack. So that way, if it does rain or something, then I, I'm not wasting time trying to find my pack cover, putting over the pack cover. Then typically, you know how it goes. <laughs> it rains for a second. And you have to throw all your stuff on, you do all this, you know, you put all this stuff, and then by the time that happens, the rain's gone type of thing. And so it avoids that. And you just kind of, I mean, a lot of these backpacks nowadays, these hyperlights and Z packs are pretty waterproof anyway. So I don't really worry too much about about that. So yeah, the Nylo Flume pack liner, I think, is I think is pretty cool. Fantastic. That's a good tip right there. So there you have it. We're just about done here. Hope our listeners enjoyed our time with Hooch. want to thank you for coming on this week. Chad, how can our listeners keep up with you on social media and where can they find updates on your next adventures? Yeah, man. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on again. It's always a great time chopping it up with Doc. Appreciate it, brother. And yeah, number one would be Instagram at Chattahoochee underscore. And then YouTube, I'm really trying to, to build this 10K subscribers on there. It's taken a while, but that's my favorite place Congrats. to create. Just my name, Chad nice. Lubinsky. Yeah, thanks, man. And then Peanut Butter and Mountains podcast on Spotify. It's also on YouTube as well. So, yeah, those are the best places to catch me. All right. Hey, remember to check out Hacker Trash Radio on social media as well. We're on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. And if you have comments or clips you want to share, you can send it to me at hikertrashradio at gmail.com. Off the beaten path. Now, unfortunately, we can't always be on the trail. And when we're not, we need to find a way to get to our, our adventure fix. So, Chad, I'm going to ask you to share some 
outdoor adventure media with our listeners to help them get by. Mm. Be a book, a movie, documentary. Call this segment Off the Beaten Path. Uh, any recommendations for us in adventure Oh, media? man. Dang it. I could have had some good ones. I, I, for, I always forget about this segment, man. This is a really good segment, too. I am a, a sucker for watching YouTube videos. I'm sure. Do you ever do you do a lot of YouTube watching? Oh, yeah. I go down the rabbit hole all the time. <laughs> it's freaking awesome, right? I, I'm trying to think. I'm looking in, like, my watch later playlist right now for anything that's good but oh man i wish i had something all right i mean for anybody that i don't know i don't know how big and i don't know how controversial hunting is or if people like it or not on this uh you know listening but i think this uh episode or this what would it be called series called meat eater set by steven ranella he's a really articulate intelligent guy wrote a ton of books but they do a really well produced job of showing how that all works and it's not because i am not about like just the kill shot the harvest shots or whatever you know what i mean like compilations i like the story of the hunts and how it and then he's a really exceptional cook so at the end of the thing all the time sometimes he doesn't but when he does, he like cooks up this awesome stew or whatever. Really, really good cook. So meat eater episodes on my recommendation, Stephen Ranella. Okay. And I think meat eater is a part of the waypoint podcast network, which so is hiker trash radio. So that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. 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 They definitely, they rip podcasts out quite often. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Have we not asked you? And before we wrap things up tonight, just one more segment for you called, what have I not asked you that you're dying to tell us about? What did we miss tonight? I mean, you covered quite a bit, man, from, what, from what's been going on. I don't know, man. I think you covered it pretty well. I think that was. We got it. We got it, man. Got Wonderland, Wonderland Trail. R3. Yeah. Yeah. R3, identity crisis, buying a new home. I mean, we, we covered <laughs> a lot of ground tonight. Yeah, brother. All right. Hey, we are finished. I want to thank you for coming on the podcast, Chad. Wish you the very best in your future adventures. Hope you'll consider coming back at some point and, and sharing some more stories All with right. us. As yeah, we man. close up today, any shout outs to friends and family? Yeah, shout out to Megan. She's been dealing with me as I've been a nutcase with us, this house. So appreciate you. Thank you.